Real people, real celebrities, real talk. Join the Breakfast Club. Weekday morning, 6 to 10. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlamagne the God. We are the Breakfast Club. We have a special guest in the building this morning. That's right, Doctor Boyce Watkins. Good morning, sir. What's happening, brother? How How's you doing? Everything? Long, oh, everything's long, good. Long time pal of mine. You know, mm-hmm. we've been having a conversation for the past two weeks about a uh, financial. I call it illiteracy. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> ever since Mr. Damon Dash left, you know, and it, and it sparked up a good conversation in our community just about finances and, you know, entrepreneurship investing and, mm-hmm. and, investing and self-empowerment. So I wanted to reach out to a, a financial expert that I know, mm-hmm. Dr. Boyce Watkins. All right. Now, well, for people who aren't familiar, tell them why you're a financial expert. Uh, well, I have a PhD in finance and I, I taught finance for about 20 years, mm-hmm. uh, University of Kentucky, Indiana University, Syracuse University, et cetera. Um, so, you know, I, I know a lot about money. I know what it's like to not have any money. Mm-hmm. Um, I used to uh, really want money. That's why I majored in finance. I wasn't even <laughs> really supposed to go to college. Mm-hmm. I figured if I studied money and learned about money, somebody would pay me money to talk about money. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then I really also learned how money can be used as a tool not just to liberate you, but it can also enslave you. I mean, we have a lot of multimillionaires uh, in our community that are scared of their own shadow, that are just afraid of everything, afraid to be controversial, et cetera. And, uh, and I think sometimes if you look at money in the wrong way, uh, money, money, it, it's powerful like fire or like a drug. Like fire mm-hmm. can either cook your food and keep you warm or it can burn you and your family alive. A drug can either heal you and make you better or it can turn you into an addict. Mm. So uh, that relationship with money, I think, is important because most of us think about money several times a day, every day. And you wrote several books on finances as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I wrote a book called Black American Money. Mm-hmm. Um, I have another book coming out uh, called It Takes a Village to Raise the Bar, A New Paradigm for Black America. Mm-hmm. And it's basically talking about, uh, you know, just ways to think about money in ways that, that money can really be the next step in our civil rights movement, you know, because, uh, you know, if you have political power without without any economic power, um, that's kind of like um, having a driver's license but not having a car. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, like you, you're not going to go anywhere unless somebody else wants you, uh, wants to give you a ride. And then at that point, you're still only going to go where they want to take you. Gotcha. So. Now, question, uh, Dame Dash, we mentioned that earlier. What did you think of Dame Dash's interview? You know what? Um, you, I, just, I, you described him as a breath of fresh air. Yeah. You, yes. Well, you know what? I, um, I liked, here's what I like about Dame. I liked... The energy that Dame comes with, like yeah. I like, mm-hmm. to me, I think that that so many black men have been so emasculated economically, and it's 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 not something that just recently happened. It's been happening for hundreds of years. That I like the idea of just having a call to manhood and kind of saying, you know, look, we can do better, you know, and and sometimes, like you think about it on the football field, uh, you know, your coach that motivates you to play, sometimes he's gonna punk you out. Right. Be like, you know, you were playing like a bitch. You know, get up. You know, right, you, right. you 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 need to win. You know, but. Uh, the thing is, I think with Dame, it's interesting because, um, you know, he's he's a little bit like a, a he, I think he was a little, trying to be kind of like an economic version of a Harriet Tubman. Like, we, you know, <laughs> I'm going to get these slaves off the plantation. I'm going to shoot gotcha. you if I have to. Right. Um, but, you know, we all understand that in order to uh, escape the plantation, you have to have a plan. Definitely. Right. Uh, to go to war, you have to have a battle strategy. But not having the strategy in hand right away does not give you an excuse to to not fight. And mm-hmm. I think that, uh, and so that's what I like about Dame. I think Dame started a conversation. Yeah. We weren't really talking about this kind of thing, Absolutely you know, not. two or three weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm glad he did it. But you it's know. deadly. It's very deadly, and it can hurt a lot well, of our well, own. Well, let's play a lot of you. Let's play well, some let's of, let's There's a lot of different things that were said. Some things yeah, that we may agree with, some things we may not well, let's agree with. Let's right play fast. some of Dame's rhetoric. Let's just start so with So you the, enjoy the safety okay. and the security of a job every day. But there's no pride in that to me. Now, let me ask you a question. There's millions of people out there that don't have that opportunity and they all have, have the a boss every day. So you're basically saying because they have a boss, there's no pride in it? I think because people on the radio tell people it's okay to have a boss. They don't understand that they can have more. It's just a pride you should have in ownership. There so how do you get to a, that platform? How do you get to the platform? By putting the... your own money up and investing in yourself. But that's the reason why we set up the platform so they don't have to do you, anything. You have a boss. But you, but you know what else is interesting? Will, you have will, a boss. How can a man say he has a boss and be proud? Okay, mm. no pride in having a job. Uh, having a boss is like calling <laughs> another man daddy. And how can you have a boss and be proud? I think that it's okay to have, I mean, everybody has some kind of a boss on some level. Like with the interview you did with Andrew, I think is his name. Um, Andrew, you know, yep. Andrew, yep. yeah. There, there's always, you know, it, it, even if you own your own business, you have someone that you have to answer to. You They're have something consumers. you have to right. right. Every day when I get up and I'm motivated, I'm answering to the boss that lives inside of me mm-hmm. that's saying, if you don't get off your butt, you're not going to achieve your goals. So everybody kind of has some sort of boss. The question is whether or not uh, you're being pimped by your life, mm-hmm. whether or not someone is is, is boss is, is your boss to the point where you don't feel free. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. you don't have any degrees of freedom in your life. You mm-hmm. feel stuck in your own existence. Um, I think 
in that situation, you have to make a change. Mm-hmm. Because here's the thing, here's the thing, and a lot of people don't get this. If, if, if you work for me, and I'm the reason that your children get to eat every day, I'm the reason that your wife has a roof over her head, you're not really the man of your house. Mm-hmm. I'm the man of your house. Mm-hmm. And so I think that uh, having someone you answer to is okay, but if you can somehow shift your situation where everything is a partnership, where you have options, mm-hmm. you know, uh, for example, uh, the question, one question you could ask is, do you have FU money? Mm-hmm. If, you're, if somebody in your job calls you the N-word or mm-hmm. disrespects you or you just hate your job, do you have enough put aside, do you have enough other options so you can walk in and say, F you, I'm out? Mm-hmm. If you can't really do that, then I would say you have to adjust something in your life. Just because you're committed to something doesn't mean you don't have options. Right. So, so um, you know, is there no pride in having a boss? I mean, I, I don't think we can agree with a statement like that per se, mm-hmm. but uh, because there's dignity in working hard, right. no matter what. But I do think that if you are being pimped by your life, you got to make an adjustment. Mm-hmm. Like I tell some of my friends who might complain all the time, I hate my job, I hate my boss, I hate this. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, you can't complain about it for too long. you got to do something about it. In that case, if you really hate it and it's not what you want to do, at some point, instead of complaining for years and years and years, you got to get up off, you know, and, and do something, change it, get a new job, mm-hmm. create some more opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, a lot of what I think we have to embrace is the idea. And I, I, I want to believe I want to believe the best about what Dame was trying to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that this is a conversation that has to be had with a community, not with one person leading this, with me, him or anybody else. Um, you know, all these ideas have to be laid on the table. But I think that what. Uh, we need to really consider is the idea and the importance of building things. We mm-hmm. need a nation of builders. Mm-hmm. That's why I love Louis Farrakhan, for example. Right? He's one of my favorite black leaders because he built his stuff. You know, he didn't climb up somebody else's tree. He he planted the seed and grew his own tree and climbed to the top of that. Well, I mean, the and, baton was passed. Right, the baton was passed. Elijah but Muhammad. but at the same time, you know, there there is a building mentality within the nation of Islam that I think we can all learn from. Uh, it does not mean that you don't form partnerships. It it doesn't mean there's no pride in in working for other people per se. I mean, I, I can't I can't sign off on something like that. But I do think that we have to resurrect the pride of building as opposed to just borrowing. Mm-hmm. Because what we don't understand sometimes is that you know, and I'm talking about I'm really talking about people of color right now. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of this stuff that's out here, it wasn't really built for us. You know, it wasn't. I mean, these corporations were created by other people of other ethnicities 100 years ago. And we get in there and we somehow become disappointed and surprised when we're treated differently because we're black and we don't get the same opportunities. But you can't really move in somebody else's house and then expect to be able to shift around the furniture. Mm-hmm. It just does not really work. Um, so I think taking that pride in building your own house and just and being proud of that. Right. Because think about this. If you start your own business, it's not you're not going to be balling <laughs> for a while, right. if ever. Right. But you have to you have to realize you can't you can't judge uh, the, the quality of a tree by the size of the seed. You know, right. every every tree is going to start tiny and, and you grow that and you grow that over several generations. Even large companies like the Ford Motor Company, if you look at the history of a company like that, it started off as a tiny seed. It, it was it was nothing. Now it's massive. Mm-hmm. And I think we have to ask ourselves not about what's happening in 2015, but what's going to be happening in 2115 with our grandchildren, great grandchildren, great great grandchildren. What are you passing I mean, on? I think to? we're planting those seeds now. I think this is the first generation of wealth for black people. You I mean Civil Rights Act was signed in 1964. We were still in segregation 51 years ago. Yeah, but I I tell you, man, I, I don't even know if black people have that much wealth. I mean, uh, the well, you're average. You're starting to see the first uh, round of billionaires. You're you know? seeing you're seeing some of the black elite doing extremely well. I don't think that the black middle and lower class are doing all that well. Uh, doesn't it take time though? I, but no, I, I it, agree. It I, one thing I do agree with is, is as a kid growing up, I didn't learn about being an entrepreneur or investing. My parents <laughs> didn't. They my my pops was a police officer. My mom worked at Guardian Life Insurance. They didn't instill that in me. I instilled that in my kids because I was a little different. But the problem I had with Dame, what I say is deadly, is, you know, you tell these kids, don't have a boss. You get out there and do it. And see, the problem with Dame is, you know, if you listen to Dame or you listen to past interviews or you listen to, to Hole's records, you see that they started their business from illegal, illegal money, activity. Illegal right. activity. So you're encouraging kids, well, I don't have a boss. I started like this. No, I, I went to college. I went to high school, got my degree. I went to college, got my degree. I started working, saved my money. And that's how I built my empire. You know, and you're telling kids, well, you shouldn't do that. And that was my problem because a lot of kids listen. Well, he is mm-hmm. saying sell T-shirts now. You know, to play that. But, but you got to get money <laughs> to sell T-shirts, though. You gotta That's get true, money too. To sell Where do you get money to sell T-shirts? Yeah, uh, you. Know, you. The drug dealer up front, you, you got to have capital. Some coke or some weed. I'm with but you. But you got you, you to have some capital. And the way you get capital is having a job and putting money on the side. 
And I don't see nothing wrong with having a boss. Well, let me let me tell I, you. I, honestly I, I I agree with you. I, I'm not. I, you know, I, I think we can agree on that for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I'll supplement with, and it's not really a matter of fighting about it one way or the other, mm -hmm. is uh, you know, there's a book called The Hundred Dollar Startup. Mm -hmm. which basically explains how you can start a business for under hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. And I know this type of stuff works because mm -hmm. uh, I started something with my brother for about $700 a couple years ago. We made a quarter million dollars within two years. Mm -hmm. Right. So just from that one business. Right. So, uh, and the thing was, if I hadn't been thinking like, okay, what can I create? What can I generate? Mm -hmm. I never would have done that. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes we get caught in thinking that a job is something that someone is supposed to give us. Mm. Uh, a job is also something you can create. It doesn't mean you have to do it. But one thing I do say is I think every parent, every parent who cares about their kids should teach their child how to have their own business, uh, even if they go work for somebody else. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you have to be an entrepreneur. Everybody isn't built for that. Right. But what I would say is uh, either run something or invest in something. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if I got together with three other people and let's say no, the other three didn't want to be entrepreneurs, they didn't have the time, they want to keep their jobs. Well, everybody comes up with, say, $2,000. Uh, you pull together that six. Mm -hmm. I get my 25% of the company, but with equity because I've got free time. So I'm going to run the company because mm -hmm. I have the expertise in the free time. Right. You guys are investors. Therefore, we all own something. But where do you think, get that money from, though? Well, if you're working, I mean, okay. it, you know, if you got a job, you can come up with 2000 bucks gotcha. over time. It may take you a year to save it or whatever, but you can come up with that. I mean, we invest in so many other things. I mean, people always say black people can't really create jobs, and I don't think that's true. We create a lot of jobs for other people. Mm -hmm. When we're spending all this money on these brands and all this other stuff that we do, uh, we're not thinking where that money is going. And and I think that is the problem that, mm -hmm. that we're, we're sort of letting our power escape. Like money is your power and you cannot give your power away because at the end of the day, you will be powerless. Before, I just I recently uh, read an article about an entrepreneur. Um, he was working at a phone store, right, where a lot of the phones that they don't sell, they don't have anything that they can do with it. Everybody, you know, mm -hmm. it might be some old phones that are just laying around. He started his own business that turned into a billion dollar business where he would get those phones that they didn't sell and he was selling them to companies that maybe, you know, at your job, everybody gets a cell phone that the company gives to you and he was selling those phones that they didn't use at the store. He was like the go-between person selling them to companies that had to give their employees cell phones and he turned it into a billion dollar business just from working at this cell mm. phone store. It's all ideas. Being, it's yeah, all it is. Ideas. A lot, and I don't think he really needed much money to start that. He just started mediating those because he saw a need. He saw that there was this overflow of phones and then he saw that there were companies that needed to give employees phones and didn't want to spend a whole lot of money. So he just merged the two ideas together. Yeah, uh, there you go. Right. I mean, and, and the thing is that to come up with those ideas, you have to have a certain kind of spirit. Mm -hmm. You have to have, you know, I mean, really creating a job for yourself. It's a little bit like um, uh, the difference between somebody who, who thinks that they can only eat if the grocery store has food or if the restaurant serves them versus somebody who says, well, actually, if worse comes to worse, I can grow my own food. I can cook my own food. I'm not going to starve, right. you know, so you should never starve to death because somebody would not bring food to you. Right. You should know how to create your own food. So I think it's an idea, you know, in terms of, of creating opportunities, it's about building the entrepreneurial spirit, mm -hmm. which starts with uh, taking pride in that. I, I, I have more so much more respect, uh, you know, when I hear about young brothers that, that don't have much who say I'm, I own something, I'm building something Then I have for people who say, oh, I work for such and such corporation. I'm making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that both people aren't accomplished. But, you know, I, I really think we have to build because I, I really think that this affects us politically and socioeconomically in the sense that people can never people don't respect you when you're always begging for something. Or, Malcolm X talked about that. He said, look, as long as you are begging for jobs from businesses that you do not own, you will always be severely unemployed. And if you look at the unemployment disparity in 1965, 1964, when Malcolm was saying this. To 2015, it hasn't changed that much. And that's why it's dangerous to tell people there's no pride in having a job. We're already complaining <laughs> about being unemployed. I, I think that you can be proud if you are a proud person, but I think at the end of the day, you have to figure out what you what you're comfortable with, what you can live with. Um, let's 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 be real. You know, racism um, is stressful for people when mm -hmm. they're dealing with. There's an angry black middle class of people who did all the right things. They went to school, they worked hard, they got these corporate jobs, and they are pissed off. Because they know they're being treated unfairly, right. but they right. don't feel like they have any options. So, and 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 some and, and in many cases, I mean, there's studies that show this affects your health. I mean, it, for a man, it kills your testosterone. Uh, you know, you can you get people get cancer. I mean, people get sick off of this mm -hmm. stuff. So my thing is, you know, you have to find a way to liberate yourself and restore your manhood because I think it, it affects our families because I think that black women have a hard time 
really respecting black men the way they should because many of us have been so beaten down by the society. We don't know what to do. We're not in positions of power. Right, right, right. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not saying there's this some sort of fundamental flaw in who we are. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that maybe we need to resurrect some ideas mm -hmm. that, can, that can restore that, that power manhood. There was nothing better that happened in my life in terms of dealing with racism than when I figured out how to start my own stuff. Right. You know, I mean, it just it, it, it made me uh, stronger. It made me prouder. It made me more courageous. You know, I got into this uh, crazy when I worked at Syracuse University. I was, you know, I was dealing with all this racism and all this stuff, and I got into this big fight with Bill O'Reilly about something. He he had said he I made a joke. That. You remember that? Yeah, he got a, he made a joke about lynching Michelle Obama, and I and I didn't like that. So you know, we got into it or whatever. Well, he worked really hard to get me fired, and and I mean, I'm talking about really hard. You know, wow. and to the point where multi million dollar donors were saying we're not going to get money to your school because you got a racist. You know how O'Reilly does. Is that he, why you stepped down? Um, that played a big part in it. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, and the only defining factor in terms of whether or not I, I could stand by what I said versus apologize for something I did not do was whether or not my financial situation was right. The right. FU money. Yes, when your money, when your FU money is right, you have the ability to be a little bolder. I'm not more courageous than other people. I just check my money, check my bank accounts, check my business, and said, okay, if I, I get fired, I'm gonna be okay. Right. You understand? So, so that's the idea. And the thing is, it doesn't. It wasn't just my situation. I think this is a microcosm of what what so many of us experience mm -hmm. every day. Um, just make sure you've got options for yourself. If you've got options, I think you're gonna be all right. I wanna ask you about what you said. I don't want, if I'm misquoting you, let me know. You said that a man is not a man if somebody, if he if he has a job that, that boss, you're not the man of your house, the boss is the man of your house? You know what, I will say this. It is fundamentally flawed for you to depend on the descendants of your historical oppressors to get the things that you need in order to survive. Mm -hmm. But I, the reason I ask you that, because you, like for somebody like you, you went to school, you busted your ass to get your degrees, right. you put yourself in that position to yes. make that money. So it's not like they're giving you something. You earn that position. Yeah, I earned it, but understand. I mean, you know, when, for example, when I, when I got my first job as a professor, um, I was the first black person they'd ever hired in the hundred year history of, mm -hmm. of that department. But I was not the first smart black person to apply for that job, right? Mm -hmm. We've had brilliant black people since there, since black people came into existence. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was the first one to get that opportunity. Um, so understand it. I mean, if, if, if someone doesn't force certain people to open the door, they just won't. They'll just, when I, in fact, I'll give you a good example. When I graduated from college, you know, I was the number one student in, in my whole senior class. I won awards for it and everything. Got two bachelor's degrees in four years. I mean, I busted my butt in school. I, I wanted to work on Wall Street. And it's funny because I'm staying on Wall Street this week and it made me think about this. I sent out 200 resumes to 200 Wall Street firms and got 200 rejection letters. Wow. wow. Yes. It, it, you know, and, and it, I mean, hurt me to the core. Right. But, you know, All you need is one. Yes, though. Was it? Yes, absolutely. It, it, one. Yes. Would have made a big difference in my life. Um, but at the same time, sometimes not getting what you want. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot like a relationship where, you know, you have been in love with somebody and they didn't want you. And then maybe a year later, you realize you're happy that they didn't want you because Thank you found goodness. somebody better. Right. Yeah. right. Right. And and it was the same way with that. Like, I, I can't explain um, when you own your own stuff, when you get a chance to feel that power of being a boss. Um, it goes far deeper than the money. Mm -hmm. If you're doing it just for the money, I think you're missing like 90% of the equation. I mean, I love money. I mean, you know, I studied capitalism and finance. I know all about that. But it's just, uh, I breathe easier every day. I get up. I don't just crawl out of bed. I bounce out of bed. Right? Um, you know, it's so I think everybody should get a chance to feel this. And I think we, we got, we definitely have to start with our kids. Right. You know, and, and, and don't, and, and there's no excuse to say, well, I don't understand entrepreneurship. I can't teach this to my kids. The best university in the history of the world is called Google.com and mm -hmm. YouTube.com. Mm -hmm. You can literally go to YouTube University and learn everything you want to know. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually have a website called Financial Juneteenth as well that people can go to, but that's one of a billion that's out there. I would recommend here. that over just going to random YouTube videos. There's okay. some poison out there, too. Okay, there you go. <laughs> All right, there you go. Uh, okay, well, I got the endorsement for Charlemagne. Thank you, brother. But, you know, yeah, but in all seriousness, like, I mean, the information is out there. And, and sometimes, really, sometimes it's something small. Um, It might be something like just saying to your kids, yeah, one day make sure you own your own business. If you say that a few mm -hmm. times a year, your, your child will hold on to that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I knew a guy, I know a guy who's a 27-year-old millionaire. And he, that's what he said. He said, my dad did not, um, you know, he didn't have his own business, but he, he just always said to me, you should have your own business. He didn't explain how to do it. 
You know, he just said, this is what you should do. So that's what I did. And now he's doing really well. You know, and, and my dad was a cop, like like your dad. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we understood the value of hard work. Um, you know, I don't know about your dad, but my dad was a very tough guy. He was a Vietnam vet. And, right, and he so. did. And I think the reason that I don't have a big problem with what Dame Dash said is because my dad has a little bit of that in him. Right. Like my dad, you know, he would straight up punk me, you know, when, when, when I got to feeling sorry for myself or like, oh, the world won't do this for me, do that for me. And and if you if you sort of sift through that energy that you're, that you're receiving that might bother you or assault your masculinity, you realize, okay, maybe he has a point. Because at the end of the day, nobody really cares that much about you in this world. Yeah, oh, no, he's you know absolutely what? right about empowerment. He's absolutely but, right but, about ownership. Hold on, so, but you know what? It was my dad that actually made me become an entrepreneur because, mm. like you said, my dad was a police officer, so he was very hard on me. And him being so hard on me, I didn't want to work for anybody. I would never wanted to have a boss like that. I swear to God. So I started doing mixtapes and started on my own and selling because I didn't want a boss. And for me, like I told Dane, radio is my passion. I love it. Like, you now people get up and you say you get that bounce in the morning. Yes. I'm not tired. I enjoy coming to work. There's not a day when I'm like, damn it, I got to come to work. When I miss work too many days, I start fidgeting. Like, I'm like, well, I got to get to work. I start calling Charlamagne like, yo, what you doing? Yes. I call him, yeah, like, what you doing? Where you at? You know, because I love this job. But to back what you said, there's a lot of people that don't need to be entrepreneurs, that don't have that in their heart. So that people who need to invest, what can they invest in? Because that's something that people just don't know. They don't, they're don't. they scared of the stock market, so they don't know mm-hmm. what they can invest in. They hear about the stock market going up and down. They feel like real estate is too much money to put 10% down or 5% down on a home. So what would you advise for, for that person that doesn't want to be an entrepreneur that, or doesn't have the time or has kids that just wants to invest their money? What would you tell them to put their money in something that can make money, not just a... A, a bank where they're going to make 2% or, you know, out of 100 years, something that they could possibly make some money? Well, the you know, when I first got started investing, um, I put my money in mutual funds. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's not complex. I mean, if you just go to your bank and say, you know, can you show me some mutual funds I can right. invest in? They'll show you what to do. They even have um, scenarios where you can set up a drip where you take a little bit of your paycheck. Yeah. It could be $10, $50, whatever. And it goes in this account over time. And I you can tell you this because of the taxes, it's, right? There you go. A lot of it. Yeah. yeah. If, you, if you do like a 401k, like a tax divert mm-hmm. type thing or 403b, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that that can be the start of kind of thinking about investing. And, and what that's what I did. I mean, you know, I had money going into my retirement account. And believe it or not, actually, when I did finally leave my job and start my own business, um, my retirement account, which had built up over the years, uh, it kind of played like it was it played a, a, the role of a small bank for me. Right. Because sometimes you can't get the capital you want. Sometimes mm-hmm. a bank won't lend it to you and you just don't have it. Um, so sometimes I'd borrow against myself right. or whatever. And and what I found, too, though, was that there are so many opportunities uh, it, it, when it comes to investing in the black community. So many opportunities that are just overlooked. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and and literally, I was able to double and triple my money pretty quickly. Mm. You know, so so just I, off the bank stuff. Uh, yeah, just off. Well, just off of diversifying uh, your portfolio. Yeah, well, now the mutual fund part that is diversification. Like yeah. a mutual fund is not something where you're picking a stock or trying to pick the right stock at the right time. Mm-hmm. Your your money's invested in thousands of stocks, yeah. and 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 really, I just put my money in, and I just made sure I had a certain like balance as far as risk. You know, not too much risk, not too little, and then I just left it alone. But that's right. you know that's longevity. Most, especially African Americans, they want that money now. Like they don't want to wait twenty years down the line to see that money flip. Well, they better they go sell that, that crack. Well, not no, the no, 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 no. <laughs> Don't more, sell crack. Something with more risk. Like, what do you advise? Because you know, I have my money in mutual funds and, and, and bonds. But you look at that money, like I, my, my kids will see that. You know what I mean? But what can they invest in now that says, you know what? Here, try this, or look at this, or maybe this might be for you, where I can make a, a, a quicker flip. Well, two things. One, um, there are billionaires being created every day on the internet. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, I'm telling you, these, these Silicon Valley cats or whatnot. I mean, they they've got it figured out. Mm-hmm. That, you know, they they create value very very quickly with very little uh, capital investment. Oh, yeah. Sometimes those apps, all those stuff, all that social media yeah. apps with Snapchat, Twitter. Oh my all goodness, those apps are killing. Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. And then, um, you know, on top of that, you know, I, I would say um, partner with someone that identifies a need and help fill it. Mm-hmm. It might be something as simple as uh, my friend bakes cookies really good. And when she goes to work and brings her cookies, everybody loves them. What's up so, with you bald head guys and cookies? My son sells cookies. Everybody sells cookies. Ain't no wrong with cookies, man. Dave, Dave Dash's son sells cookies, too. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, does he? Yeah, 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 I mean, maybe there's money in cookies. I don't know. I, I don't know. I like cookies. I like cookies. That's what Dave's son here. My son sells cookies. <laughs> well, you know, I, I mean, it, it, you know, so, so a lot of times, you know, I, I can tell you, I've made most of my money like that. Just mm, really? identifying a little need and, and, and you know, if I have a friend that wants to do something and they need five hundred dollars to get started, I invest. I own half the company or whatever, and then you know you make money that way. Um, yeah, most of my money has been built 
from small businesses I created, you know, online and offline, as opposed to the the long term stuff with the stock market. So I think people should do both a now, little look, bit of both. Right. We're being real, realistically, right? So now you open up a business. Who do you hire to run your business? Who do you hire as your employees? Uh, well, I, I do don't. Do you hire be- African Americans or do you hire people that best suit the job? I think you do both. Um, I, th- I I'm a big fan of of hiring black people. Um, you know, because because. People tend to hire people like them. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, that, that's, that's why a lot of times people think it's a race issue with employee discrimination, but actually it's just like, no, I'm just hiring people who are, I, I, I relate to. Right. And, relate and, to me. Yeah, and sometimes black people, we're the only ones who kind of fall for that that lie that, that we shouldn't uh, love our love our people that are like us and support our own community. Um, if you go to like Jewish communities and Arab communities, right. I mean, they are hooking up their family members first and Word foremost. Up, absolutely. Now, now at the same time, you know, you don't want to hire relatives who are going to screw up your company or or ruin your relationship by doing a bad job. So there are some relatives I would never hire in a million <laughs> years. But uh, but I'm always when I have an opportunity, I look to the people around me first. I take care of people in my circle, in my family, blood family or not, right? Mm-hmm. And then if I can't find somebody in my family, then I might go outside of that. Uh, this company, uh, sites like Odesk and Elance, where you can find contractors at a good price, stuff like that if you don't have a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but I'm, I'm a big fan of supporting your own. I mean, why, why wouldn't we not do that? I mean, that's that's really essential to survive. A lot of people are scared of our own. A exactly. Lot, a lot of, I think a lot of African Americans are scared to hire our own and are fearful of our own, you know? It's one of those things that's like you're scared of yourself, and I see that a lot. You know, I, I think sometimes the the biggest supporters of white supremacy are black people, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we truly believe that we are a flawed brand of society. We, it, Some of us, you know, we really, uh, we, we say things about ourselves that are disparaging. Uh, many of us, because we don't have, we don't always have a culture to connect to. Remember, a, a lot of black history doesn't even start for many of us uh, before slavery. We don't, we have no clue what happened to us before we arrived on slave ships. Right. So for many of us, we, we, we might uh, assimilate, latch our minds on to attaining acceptance within, say, white institutions as a sign of progress, right? We'll say something like, okay, well, so-and-so was the first black man to get into Harvard, and I'm very proud of that, which, fine, okay, Harvard's you should, a good You should school. be proud of Harvard. Right, 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 right. right. But, but here's the thing, though. Right, you don't, you don't really hear white folks saying, well, this is the first white man to get into Morehouse. Yeah. They, they don't care. Right. They don't consider uh, a assimilation or acceptance by us to be a step up. Yeah. But we consider assimilation acceptance by them to right. be a step up, and I just don't think that that's a healthy way to think. I look at things like that, I'm like, it's not the black person that's making progress. Harvard is making progress progress because they're finally accepting us exactly exactly and 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 and, i mean and we're i mean we are such a strong and capable people i mean intellectually physically and otherwise Mm -hmm. you know even if you look at sports you know like there 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 really is no sort of white version of shaquille o'neal no white version of kobe bryant Uh, i think that there is something about the fact that we survived uh, hundreds of years of the most brutal torture ever dropped on any group of human beings on the planet and I think that's what makes people fear us. Mm-hmm. And so if you fear something, if you are a trainer of a big elephant and you know that elephant could crush you in a second, what do you do? You have to control the elephant's mind from the very beginning and, and make him think you're the boss. And I think that's kind of what happens to us. I think that we're trained to hate ourselves so much. Uh, we, we will kill each other. We will dis, you know, dog each other out. We won't support each other. And I, and I think that's a problem. And we will dis-empire. Well, you know what? You um, empire, I don't Dr. think Boy. I think it, I think that Lee Daniels, uh, to some extent, is might be dissing all of us. You know, I mean, you know, <clears throat> don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I'm not hating on people that enjoy the show. I'm not attacking people who work on the show. But um, here's the thing: black men are the most incarcerated group of people on the planet. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's no we incarcerate more black men in America than South Africa did during the height of apartheid. Mm-hmm. And if, if apartheid was considered the most racist regime in history and we incarcerate more black men than they did, what does that say about America? Right. So given that that is true, many of those incarcerations occur. Uh, many of those men are innocent and women as well. Um, it, it occurs. Everybody but, in jail is innocent, though. Well, not everybody. Well, I mean, that's what they say. That's what everybody says. They're not. Right? They don't say it. But but there are so many everybody cases. Everybody says they are. But, oh, no, no, everybody in jail. Right, says but, they're but, but right. But every week on your black world, we're writing about some brother that went to prison in 1982 for something he didn't do. Right. Did 30 years, and then they gave him half a million dollars or something. Like that's going to make it better. One, one brother, in fact, got got nine million because uh, he was sent to prison for a rape he did not commit. Uh, he, but he was raped many, prison, many times in prison. Yeah. Ooh, caught a, caught it. HIV in the process. Yeah, that just, to- I just saw that story. That was yes, awful. Yes, and on top of that, the prosecutors a year later, a year after they incarcerated him, found the guy who committed the crime, locked him up, but didn't release him and kept him in prison for 30 years and he had a newborn daughter. This is the Holy kind of atrocity, fish. the kind of mm-hmm. holocaust, really, mm-hmm. that we're dealing with. So in the light of that, with that as the backdrop of all of this, uh, we have to understand, in many cases, when that brother goes before that all-white jury, 
a many a lot of times a prosecutor to get a conviction, all he's got to do is paint some picture of this black man being a thug. Right. And that's why George Zimmerman was released because they showed pictures of Trayvon smoking weed, like oh he was a thug. But we know George Zimmerman was the real but, thug, yeah. right? right. Uh, Jordan Davis, when he got murdered for playing his music too loud, they painted him as a thug in the courtroom. There are a lot of that we're, guy we're, got sentenced to a lot of time. He, he got he got his time. Absolutely. Thank God, thank God. But then you got Brian Banks, the football player who was falsely accused of rape, who lost his whole career because of that that accusation. His attorney told him, he said, Brian, you are a big black man. Uh, if you go in front of that all-white jury, they are going to send you to prison. You're not going to get justice because you're a big black man. That's why he took the plea. A lot of brothers go to prison for taking the plea. We know this, right? right. So the question that I ask myself yeah, is... What do with Empire? Right. Let me, gotcha. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get the Empire. Okay. The, the question I ask myself is, if you've got this all-white jury, many of whom don't even have any black friends, don't know a whole lot of black people, why is it so easy to convince them that this black man is a scary thug? Perception. Right, perception, yeah. which comes from many times the media. Okay. So in my opinion, it doesn't mean that I hate Empire. I, I saw it. It's a, it's a good show. But I said, you know, I have to be a conscientious objector to the consistent uh, the portrayal of black men as criminal, thug, gangster type people because that's not who we are. I agree with you, but this is my thing too. Art reflects life, right? And I feel like guys like Lee Daniels, they're only showing us one POV of African Americans. They're not showing the guys like you. They're not showing, we need more stuff like Selma showing guys like Martin Luther King Jr. We don't need any more slave movies. No. We could do it, we could do it without the thug experience. We've heard that yes. numerous amount of times in music mm -hmm. and movies. So I don't think it's necessarily Lee Daniels' fault. He's just showing us one POV of African Americans. Yeah, and in and, and my opinion, when I look at the trail of Lee's work, um, he's showing kind of a very consistent POV that kind of shows this kind of the basement of black life. Just the the most the worst, most disgusting things that happen in the black community. When I when I looked at Precious, I mean I was depressed mm. when I walked out. African American that. horror movie. Right. It was like, you. what the hell is this, man? Like, <laughs> are you serious? You. Like that like this poor girl was getting crapped on the whole movie. And, I hated it. And then it's here's the thing. And when I found out it was I thought it was real. But then when I found out it wasn't real, I was like, damn, you could have a happy ending at least. Yeah, it's like yeah. it's like it reminds me of Quentin Tarantino. His movies are so sick mm -hmm. that you're just like, man, like what did you go through as a child? So I literally studied Lee's background. Like I read his Wikipedia page in detail and tried to just understand what he went through. <laughs> and if you look at Lee's background, he's experienced some horrible shit. Right. Excuse my French. I didn't mean you good, you good. My bad. Okay. You know, he's he's gone through some terrible things. And, you know, the, the, the trauma, the abuse, you know, being, uh, you know, denied love by his family. Uh, he talks about his sister as an obese crack addict. And I think that when you go through that kind of trauma as a, as a, as a, as a black person, which a lot of us do, uh, you can somehow associate your blackness with just the very worst things that can happen, you know, in, in a society. So what do you do then? Then you somehow might be convinced that maybe on the other side of town where the white folks live, that that's the paradise. That's where you want to be. That's right. where life gets good. And I think that that's unfortunate because I think there are a lot of healthy experiences that occur in the black community. And I don't see those portrayed as regularly in me. I mean, Blackish, you got Blackish now. Yes, I love Blackish. Blackish. But this is, the, this is the problem, though. You, you look at Empire, right? Or Love and Hip Hop, and you say, you know what? This is not positive for my people, but it's gonna make me a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. Then this is this is the problem. You say, well, if I don't make it, somebody else gonna make it. So why don't I make it and make the money? How, why we can't just look at it as entertainment? Like how you said about white people, mm -hmm. and you said white people. Um, so because if I, I make the money, I could put the money into yeah. positive things and maybe help the youth. Maybe he's doing it, maybe he's not. But I look at some things like that where you know you look at your love and hip hop and it's an effed up show, and you look at Empire and it's so many stereotypes. It pisses me off sometimes. Like they're fighting it. Tell the cops, F like it's so stereotypical I, that when I walk out my house, I feel like my neighbors are looking at me like, mm -hmm. listen, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Envy is right, but how you said about white people, they don't look at uh, white people getting into more house as an accomplishment. Do you think they look at their own entertainment and say Quentin Tarantino's bad for white people? The stuff he makes, all the music that well, this, people were mad the, about Guns the Sopranos and, Roses and, and for Mob Wives. Italian yeah. work, Italian people. Yeah. Yeah. White people get upset and, like how we do. And well, say, well, I, affecting our people. Well, I think that whites have the luxury. Again, this this does come back to white privilege and, and white supremacy to some extent. I mean, because they own the media outlets. They get such a diverse array mm -hmm. of portrayals. Um, mm -hmm. But but I have a lot of friends in Hollywood. I'm sure you do too. Who will say. You know, I get tired of going into auditions and having them tell me to be the, the black woman with the attitude, swing my talk loud, mm -hmm. et cetera. Or, or I, I get tired of, of being asked to be the black man who portrays a thug. I, I remember I, I was very proud of Idris Elba because he took a stand and was saying, like, there are certain roles I just will not play, even for Tyler Perry. And he right. was in a Tyler Perry movie. Right. Um, and, and, I, and, and so the thing about media to me is that media is, is, is just one of the most uh, powerful forms of propaganda known to man. Michael I mean, Right. It, I mean, it is. You control is, the media, it, you control the mind. Yes. I mean, Hitler used media uh, to justify the persecution and the abuse and the slaughter of the Jews. 
All you got to do is you, you paint them as menaces to society, as these fundamentally dysfunctional people, these 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 the almost like a, almost like a roaches and maggots that you have to right. exterminate. And then people will sign off on allowing you to exterminate them. Uh, well, it's hard to argue that that's not what's been consistently happening with, with black people. I mean, even when we were being lynched on a regular basis, they didn't just lynch black people just for being black. They would always have an excuse. It would always be, well, he was he touched that white woman, or or he stole mm -hmm. some cookies, or we back to cookies. Yeah, cookies. Right, right, right. <laughs> I, I guess I'm, I want, I'm gonna eat some cookies after. We got you know, but, cookies in here. I know, right? I need some cookies. But you know, so 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 you know, at the end of the day, I think that you know a lot of what we're seeing in media. We have to not make sure we don't fall for this idea that it's just entertainment. I mean, that, yeah. that's how propaganda works: is you convince people that it's just entertainment, mm -hmm. and nothing is just entertainment. But Most of the time, there's an agenda. Even even Lee mm -hmm. and his producers said that you know our goal is to blow the lid off homophobia in the black community. They understand that entertainment does have an impact on the way people right. think. No, that's true. I actually said when I heard him say that statement, I said I think Lee Lee, you care more about homophobia than we do. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Well, like I ain't tripping off it like that. See, but the, but the problem is, is especially in our community, we idolize that. And like Charlemagne says all the time, you know, we we like to go to the schools and talk to the kids. But you know, growing up in Queens, I see my dad, and I see my dad work mad overtime to make sure my Christmas was great, and spent a lot of money to put me in Catholic school. But then I would see all the drug dealers driving up the block, working an hour or two, and they had the expensive cars, the nice jewelry, the women. And I think for our community, we look at that as making it. We don't look at the at the family as I had my mother and father in the household and I had my father there on, on, on Christmas and my father never went to jail. You know, we don't look at that. So when you see some of these movies and we talk about some of these movies, Menace to Society, you know, and uh, what, what's the other movie that you just said the other day that you Boys love? in the Hood. Boys in the mm. Hood. Juice. Juice. And uh, what's the nice movie? <laughs> New Jack oh, City. New Jack City. Baby. You know, Nino so those movies we, we love. We, we love watching it and we enjoy watching those type of movies. I never but, gave a damn about Tony Montana. But now, I was now, a Nino Brown type of movie. movies that, <laughs> that we like enjoy me. watching. Besides Coming to America, I can't really think of a yeah, positive but, but movie. But it was that TV, I've really though. Been. Bill Cosby. A different world. We don't have none of that now. Martin yeah. was positive to me because Martin had a right. job. Martin did radio. Right. But, and, 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 he, and he loved he, lo he loved the like black woman too. I mean, that's that's important yeah. as well. Right. Absolutely. Well, besides that, on TV, what do we have now? You I'm know, be honest you with look you. at Scandal. It, it seems like now, the black woman's the side chick. It's I interesting mm -hmm. because they just did an article that I was talking about um, in Deadline, right? And they were saying that um, right now the pendulum might have swung a bit too far in the opposite direction. There's a uh, too few roles uh, before there were too few roles for actors of color in Hollywood. But now, according to this article, uh, basically 50 percent of the roles in a pilot have to be ethnic. And the mandate goes all the way down to guest parts. And basically mm. what they're saying now is that it's just swung too far in the other direction. I mean, I, I think there could be progress. I mean, I think that people being more sensitive to um, just just here's the thing. The reason I like blackish is not because I believe that everything is 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 cotton candy and, and cupcakes. It's because black ish allows black people to be human. Uh, we're very diverse, heterogeneous people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of us are nerdy. Some of us, you know, some of us are uh, scandalous or whatever. And, and I just like to see stuff that uh, where, where you're being black is not the first thing that people understand about your character. Right. In fact, when, when I went to South Africa this week or a couple weeks ago, um, I love the fact that that people didn't care that I was black because everybody was black. Right. You know, at that, at that point, people want to know more about who you are as a person. But sometimes in America, the first thing people know is I'm a black guy and they and it comes with all this baggage and all these expectations and stereotypes. And I think that's a heavy burden for all of us to carry. I mean, that's like that in the media, too, because like I'm the type of person. If I see a situation happen between a police officer and a young black male, I don't think this is a white police officer, black male first. The first thing I think is what happened. Mm -hmm. I want Absolutely. to know the scenario first. You know what I'm yes. saying? Before I just jump to, oh, he was white, he was black, it was racism. Absolutely. I mean, that, that's that's what we would call critical thinking, mm -hmm. which we have to do. I mean, and it's really important because we got so many cases that are being revealed now of, of black people being shot by the police. And I think the biggest mistake we can make is assume that, is assuming that every white cop just wakes up with a bloodthirst and wants to kill black people. Yeah, who wants? That? I don't want that kind of fear. I, I find right. myself paranoid and scared. Like, whoa. Yeah. You know? yeah. Now, but at now, the same now we, time, we do know that racial profiling does. Absolutely, exist. it's very, very real. And, and I would say, yeah. I would say, envy can say. I mean, with, with your dad, I, I assume you knew some cops that worked with your dad on the mm -hmm. force. Um, I know from my experience, I saw the good and the bad. Right. I mean, I've seen cops that that just were good people that wanted to help. I mean, think about it. I mean, a good cop. 
you know, has a really tough job because you have to care about problems that are not yours. Right. You you know, it, a lot of times you're helping people get a cat out of a tree or help, right. you know, just help somebody find directions or, you know, just little things that, that a lot of us don't really want to do. And then you're putting yourself in harm's way. Right. But then you've got those cops who do abuse their authority. Uh, there are many reasons to be afraid of cops. We live in a society where people assume that cops are innocent and that if you are the quote unquote criminal, that somehow the cops should get the benefit of the doubt about what happened, right? And what also makes it difficult is when you had bad experiences with cops, that mm -hmm. makes you not trust cops, period. Absolutely, right. absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think good cops should be taking the lead in terms of helping weed out bad cops. Absolutely, I, you know, because because right. it hurts, it hurts all of them. It I mean, you know, because we we need good cops in in the world in our community. I, I don't think anybody would want to live in a world without police officers. Okay. That's because I, I don't see a black cop and be like he's good, and see a white cop and be like he's right. bad. I just see cops period and be like i'm staying away from yeah, all I'm away from yeah. That. <laughs> yeah yeah i mean you know that that blue wall of silence is real um mm -hmm. cops are are uh, you know threatened in many many ways sometimes threatened even with death uh for speaking up um and i think that's it's the system that is really is the culprit there uh so because you're just as likely to be abused by a black cop as by a white cop in many cases um, so, so, cop, yeah. so that's what we kind of have to deal with and not get so caught up in the black and white and not caught up in this idea that 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 every cop who shoots a black man uh, somehow is, is a bad, evil person. I, I, I don't think cops just get up wanting to kill people every day. That's just my theory. But it's, it's also media, though, too, because, you know, I look at my son, you know, and um, we live in a nice area in Jersey. So what he sees is what's on TV. So when you when you look on Channel 12 or Channel 1 or the news channel, all you see is young African-American on TV doing bad. They never mm -hmm. show positivity. Never right. show positivity. They'll say eight people shot in Newark. This is what the suspect looks like. P uh, eight people shot in Patterson, two people shot in the Bronx, two people shot in Brooklyn. So my son starts to see African Americans as bad. But you gotta show them different, right? right see, but, I've but, never been the type to put that much cachet into the media or uh, entertainment. But, but, my, my mother and father but, kept but a book in my face. But my dad, there's a lot of people out there that don't have parents raising them, and they are mm -hmm. raised from media and raised from music. Yes. There's a lot of yeah. kids out there like That's that. That makes dangerous. it difficult. That's and what it's, it's dangerous, and it's very dangerous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, you know, what, what we what we still I think have not quite figured out is that the mass incarceration epidemic that started in the 70s has obliterated the black family. I mean, this whole 72% of black children being born without a father in the house, that didn't really start until so many fathers were being sent to prison and marginalized. Mm -hmm. I'll give you one example. Um, there's a guy I know uh, in Chicago, Mario Lloyd, sold some cocaine, never killed anybody. At least, you know, he wasn't convicted for anything like that. He did like kill that. somebody if he sold cocaine. There you go. Well, there was, was a family, right. it was a, maybe it been right. a woman that overdosed. There could you go. Yeah, okay. Somebody could have killed somebody for that coke. We got to stop saying that. Yes. Okay, coke. okay, fair fair enough. He, he, sold, he sold cocaine. Uh, people were hurt by this, mm -hmm. right? Uh, absolutely. But here's the interesting thing. When they, when the feds uh, took him away, uh, they locked him. They gave him 15 life sentences for, for nonviolent first time offense. They locked up his mother. They locked up his sister and they locked up his brother. So the question is, oh, when conspiracy. you. Right. right. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So when you lock up an entire family, what happens to those kids? Right. I mean, 20 years later, Mario's son gets murdered in the same neighborhood that his father used to deal drugs in. You need those role models there. You you can't think a community is going to prosper when you're killing off all the men. It's but you know, none of this would have happened if you would have never sold coke. And I mean, I used to sell right. dope, but it's just that simple. Just yeah, but but but, but right, I agree. I agree. Breaking the law is wrong. We yeah. all we all agree on that. But the punishment has to fit the crime. I mean, 15 life sentences. I, I don't understand that. Uh, you know, another brother, Daryl Darryl Pageant, got uh, 40 years for possessing a gram of crack. I mean, come on now. And if you really want to see if you, if you really want to see people breaking the law, if you really want to see people possessing drugs, go to a college campus on the weekend. <laughs> yeah. But I guarantee yeah, you they yeah. will never raid a college campus the way they'll go up in the hood and lock everybody up. And not only that, you said people shouldn't sell drugs. And, and I know this is going to be a tough statement, but I understand it at times. Like like you said, you just named a young man sell that, that got to take care of his his grandmother, his mother, and his brother. A, He's the man of the house. Get a job. And you say get a job. But McDonald's making $9 now hey, is not going to pay that. Part, 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 part of what makes that hard is the community. Community that you, the environment so that you grow up into, if everybody around you is doing something and that's how you were raised and that's what mm -hmm. everybody's doing, sometimes it's hard Not saying because it's hard. that's the I'm environment. I'm going to tell you why I don't understand it. I don't understand it because I've seen the outcome. The outcome is jail or death. Right. That's it. Right. That's it. So that's I, why I don't understand mm -hmm. it. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting different the, results. The, but, the, but his head is looking but at But I know people who have said, listen, I grew up in a terrible neighborhood. That's what everybody was doing. That's what every all my role models were doing, that everybody around me that just seemed normal. And so that's what makes it, I think, difficult sometimes for people. And then you give him 15 consecutive life sentences and he mm -hmm. never has a chance to 
do something else or experience something else or get a second chance. But there's always and, Jamal that didn't get the life sentences that made the money. It's that always got Charlemagne. Out. There's the Charlemagne that but didn't get I don't it, think but, people you, getting them type of opportunities no more. But, but some people are. You know? No, and, and here's another interesting thing. I mean, you know, when you talk about that scenario of working at McDonald's, um, I live on the south side of Chicago, and a lot of those kids just cannot find jobs anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, there are some neighborhoods where a black youth or black man especially has an easier time getting a gun than he has of getting an education or getting a decent job. You know, so so I think that is part of uh, part of the issue as well. And then I think a fundamental question to really ask is uh, we know teenagers are fun are, are just pretty stupid a lot of times. You know, not not right. dumb in, in terms of, you know, but a lot of us did dumb stuff when of we were teenagers, antisocial stuff. Right. So the question to me is, you know, what's the cost of making a mistake? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, why is it that for some people in our society, like you look at somebody like a George Bush, that's what I was talking about. I actually wrote a book called What If George Bush Were a Black Man? Because I literally Great said, read, I, I said, thank you, brother. I appreciate that. I said, so, you know, what would have happened if George Bush were a, a, a poor black kid in Cabrini Green projects in Chicago and made the same mistakes he made? He'd still right? be there. Right, exactly. He, he, oh, he, he, he would still be there. He'd be dead or he'd be in, in prison. Yeah. <laughs> he certainly would never have had a chance to become president and make up for his mistakes. Right. So so I think that for so for some of us actually be, uh, to be, become president and make more mistakes. But go ahead. Well, there you go. Well, yeah, I mean, like, well, he's a war criminal. I mean, we yeah, know yeah, that. Yeah, right. Yeah. And 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 so, you know. To me, I think that we have to really question why we have a society where, for certain people, one mistake at the age of seventeen or eighteen can destroy you for life. I right? agree with you that. Know, um, you know, my my um, my old my older brother figure. He was really my uncle, but he was like my older brother. You know, I remember when he went to prison at seventeen, and I don't know what happened when he was in prison, but I know bad things can occur, and and I all I know is that. When he came out, he just wasn't right mentally. Right. You know, he only did two years, but prison is such a nightmare. I mean, mm -hmm. people are being tortured in prison. Think about I mean, getting you know, raped. Getting raped. And we make jokes about that. That's not funny. <laughs> rape is not funny. It's not. Right. It's okay. It's okay. You can, man I, rape is a little funny sometimes. No, it's not. It's never funny. No. 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 It definitely doesn't. <laughs> No, no that's a nightmare. Yeah, right. It, it's 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 a nightmare. It's torture. It's a human rights abuse. Yes. And so, and we put people through that, and then we think, oh, somehow you're gonna come out and be rehabilitated. We know that's not gonna happen. No, you and, you, and, you and you're marginalized for life. You can't get a job. I mean, really, the 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 the, the truth here is that we live in a country now where 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 incarceration has become profitable. So it I is. think now we have a country where people don't really want you Jail to get away from the, the stock system. market. There prisons you go. On the, stock market. the private prisons, exactly, yeah. exactly. You so need to come up here more often, man. I want to. I'd be glad to. I want to. Let's play one more Dame Dash clip. Play the saving money clip because you know Doctor Dr. Boyce Watkins is a jack of all trades, but he's really good at finance. I want it. <laughs> and nine to fives aren't good because you look you hustling for a weekend. But then you have like you never worked your way up to Yo, a position. You didn't just no, I jump out of the tycoon. I never had a job. But you didn't jump out of the tycoon. that got the oil. Yes, I did. I went and grabbed it. I flipped from the womb. Yes, from the womb. I was Dame Dash the day I was born. But you didn't have everything that you have now from the womb. Then. The way I got it was not by a job. I got it by putting up my own money. Like one day I have a lot of money and then the next day I don't. You know why? Because I put it all in the street. You keep saying, yo, you just started. You did. No, dog. I've always flipped. I don't put up money. Saving money's for suckers to me. I, I have so much confidence in me that I flip. And 20 years later, I'm still a boss and you still got a job. I would love to close on this. <laughs> what do you think of that? Um, I think that the goal of being a boss is a good objective to have. I don't think everybody has to be Dame Dash. Um, you know, there are many people who are bosses who have philosophies that might differ from Dame. Um, I like the way he he just he 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 awakened the sleeping dragon with with just bold commentary. I mean, Dame Dash is Dame Dash. He's always going to be that person. Um, it, it, you know, but there's no Jay Z without Dame Dash. We know that that type of thing. Um, and I give him. We have to give him credit for that. Absolutely. Uh, right. His his desire to take risk. Uh, sometimes has led to tremendous fortune and sometimes some misfortune. Right. But remember, you know, you can't diss Dame's uh, commentary per se just because he's not always doing as well as he might have hoped. Because remember, Donald Trump declared bankruptcy four times. Right. Right. So, so, so he's that saving money for suckers. Right. Now, the idea of saving money being for suckers, um, it, no. I mean, come on. That 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 you can't say that. Um, but I would say that that simply saving money. Doesn't make sense. I think and saving it just sit there, right? Saving and investing is really the best approach, right? So, uh, so the idea at the end of the day is find ways to keep your money in your pocket and put it into things that are going to empower you. Eventually, your money has to start working for you, mm -hmm. um, and and everybody can do it. Uh, get out of the the what I would call the slave mentality. The slave mentality to me is when when you will go work 10, 12 hours a day 
because somebody told you to come to work and they're going to give you a minimum wage paycheck. But when it comes to working half of that time to achieve goals for yourself, whether they be educationally mm. or entrepreneurially or whatever, you can't put in the time. Right. You ain't got time. You want to go get turned up. You want to watch basketball wise or whatever. <laughs> and, and that doesn't make sense to me. Why? Why would you spend more time building somebody else's dream and right. no time building your own? Absolutely. That makes no sense I, to me. I always tell interns, interns be like, well, how do I have time to go to school and have a job and do an internship? It's 168 hours in a week. Boom. You invest time in what you want to invest time in. That's right. Period. Right. There you go. There, well, there you, go. you have it. Dr. Boyce Watkins, we appreciate you joining us. Yeah, you got to come more no. often, man. Yeah, Thank you, you brother. Back. Oh, yeah. I Absolutely appreciate the invitation. I respect Anytime all you guys. in New York. Because, I mean, financial Thank literacy you. is something that I think more of us need, especially after what I've heard the past couple of weeks. I've, <laughs> I've had heard some of the dumbest <laughs> financial tips from people. I'm like, y'all have no clue what y'all are talking about. Well I, well, I respect you guys and, and, and Charlamagne. I've always respected you. Back back when we did stuff with you, when Wendy's show, man, you you always Charlamagne always respected me even when nobody else did. <laughs> and that's why I love this brother. That's Thank you. Thank you, brother. All righty. It's the Breakfast Club, Dr. Boyce Watkins.